Good to be with you again tonight. Thanks so much for being here. I, uh, I had a, a lesson with me. Of course, you know, we preachers, we always have a spare sermon with us, right? Uh, so when I got word this afternoon that I needed to preach, I was, I was ready to go. But I didn't have a PowerPoint for this lesson. But I, uh, I made one this afternoon. So uh, hopefully, hopefully that'll help us as we study together. Psalm 14 is where we're going to begin. Psalm 14. Did you notice as we were reading from 2 Peter chapter 1 that Peter said three times in those verses, verses 12 to 15, that he wanted to stir up the saints by reminding them. You know, we need reminders. We need people to tell us things over and over again. And that's really been the premise of Ronnie's Bible class here on Sunday mornings, that there are things in Scripture that we need to know, and we need to be reminded of those things over and over again because they're foundational. We can't get away from those foundational concepts. But we need reminders in our personal lives, too. We need reminders about doctor's appointments and lunch appointments and business appointments. And so we get out our handy smartphones and we open our calendars and we say, remind me that I have breakfast at 8 a.m. and I'm meeting with this client. Or I have a dental appointment at 2.30 on Thursday. We need those reminders because if we don't set them, we're going to forget. So there are things that we need to be reminded about. And I think it's true for us spiritually in our personal lives. There are things congregationally that we need to be reminded of, but there are things personally and individually that we need to be reminded of as well. And so tonight what I want to do is consider three things that I need to remember. Three things that I think all of us need to remember, and here we do not go. There it is. All right. It helps if you turn the clicker on. Uh, so. I'm adjusting to a new clicker. Yet one more thing I've got to figure out. So, I want to talk about three things I need to remember. And I suspect as we go through this lesson tonight, these will be three things that you need to remember too. Sometimes we lose track of these things, and so I hope these things will help us. Number one, I want to suggest to you that we need to remember that there is a God, and it's not me. Now, you may be thinking, well, duh. I mean, we know that. It may even seem strange or laughable that I would put that up here, but, but truthfully, it's, it's not. Well, let's just talk about people in the secular world for a moment. They need to know this truth. And I believe that the Bible says that even people who deny the existence of God, they know this is true. And yet they choose to put Him out of their hearts and out of their minds anyways. That's why I had you open to Psalm 14. Psalm 14, look at verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. That language may sound familiar to you. Paul quoted this passage in Romans chapter 3. That passage in Romans 3, he is presenting these Old Testament scriptures and he's working towards a conclusion. And the conclusion comes in Romans 3 and verse 23, that verse that we quote all the time. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul uses Psalm 14 as one of his proof texts to make that point. And so he gives a number of Old Testament scriptures and he comes to that conclusion that all men are sinners, that all fall short of the glory of God and he appeals to Psalm 14, where the psalmist says, There is no one who does good. All men have become corrupt. But the fool says in his heart, There is no God. Now go to Romans chapter 1 with me. Romans chapter 1. And this is the passage that I'm, I'm really thinking of when I say that even secularists know that there really is a God, but they choose to put him out of their minds. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 beginning. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. Or maybe your translation says is evident to them. 
for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Paul says, look around you. Go outside and open your eyes and you will know that there is a God out there who made all of this. When you see the rocks and the rivers and the trees and the clouds, you know that it couldn't just happen. Any person with common sense can look at nature and say, this is incredible. This didn't create itself. Then in verse 21, Paul says, For even though they knew God, even though these people walked outside and they said, Wow, there must be someone out there who did this. Even though these people were able to come to that conclusion, Although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And Paul, I think drawing on that language, says, and in their foolish hearts, they became darkened. And so professing to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Now the rest of this chapter, Paul just goes on to, to delineate all of the sins that mankind has pursued. And so, verse 18, he speaks of men who suppress the truth. They push the truth down. They push it out. They don't want people to know the truth. And so they're doing whatever they can to stamp it out. These people do not honor God because they profess to be wise. You know, we don't need God anymore. We've, we've moved beyond those primitive concepts. And these people give heed to speculations. These are people who believe in the God of self. Secularists deny Him daily. But you know, we Christians can do the same thing if we're not careful. We can give in to the God of self as well. Let me suggest to you three, three things, three ways that we can do that. It may be that we give in to the God of self-indulgence. And so in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 4, Paul would talk about people who are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And in Philippians 3, in verse 19, he talked about carnal people, and he said that their God is their belly. Their God is their appetite. What he means is their God is their fleshly, carnal desires. And so it is possible for us to indulge in earthly things, whatever those things may be. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's food. Maybe it's sex. Maybe it's unhealthy relationships. But we can indulge in these worldly things, these carnal things, and that self-indulgence becomes a hindrance to indulging in anything spiritual or anything heavenly. We choose those earthly carnal things rather than those heavenly and spiritual things. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, if you turn there with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27, I like what Paul says here. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27, where Paul says, I discipline my body. And I make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. I like that concept of disciplining our body. Making our body our slave. And what he's saying in this application is, we are not overly indulgent in any worldly thing. Stacy loves chocolate. So do I. And I don't know that our affinity for chocolate has ever gotten on the edge of overindulgence. But there are a few desserts in particular that might tempt us to get to that point. And so we need to watch out for the God of self-indulgence. We need to discipline ourselves 
so that these things don't become our God. What about the God of self-enhancement? You know, self-improvement, self-enhancement, it can be a good thing when our motives are good and right. When our motives are, are properly aligned. So, educational attainment, going to college, maybe going to graduate school, career advancement, trying to work hard and get a promotion, all of those things are good and, and fine in and of themselves. But when self-enhancement becomes a God, when it becomes our primary focus in life, so when that search for greater education or for career advancement becomes an avenue for our own selfishness and our own indulgence to connect to our previous point then then we then we're entering into sin self-enhancement is not a bad thing when properly restrained what about the God of self-promotion self-promotion I think that social media has just brought this to new heights you know, I'm just going to draw attention to myself so that everybody will know what I'm doing and what I am thinking. And then, so I'm going to get on Facebook, and I'm going to get on Twitter, and I'm going to get on Instagram, and I'm going to put all of this stuff out there so the whole world can see me. Brother and sister, I want to tell you, you and I are not as important as we sometimes think we are. I think we need to be talking to our young people about this. That if we're going to post something on Facebook or if we're going to post something on Twitter, we need to be asking ourselves, why am I doing this? Frankly, the world does not need to know what you ate for breakfast today. And you know, truthfully, and I don't want to crush, you know, tender egos here, but truthfully, nobody cares what you ate for breakfast today. They may not be so polite to tell you that. I will. I'll tell you that. Nobody cares what you ate for breakfast. Nobody cares that you bought a new sweater for your dog. And we could just multiply examples. I've seen things on Facebook that just leave me scratching my head saying, why in the world did you think that was important? But you know, if you could tweet a Bible verse, I'd love for the world to see that. But we need to be asking ourselves, why am I posting this to social media? Am I doing it so, so everybody will look at me and look at what I'm doing and so they'll, you know, like what I'm doing? Or, or maybe now they can love it thanks to Facebook. They can love what I'm doing. Are you still in 1 Corinthians chapter 9? Turn the page to chapter 10. Look at verse 31. Whatever then, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I think that includes Facebook and Twitter and any other form of communication where we might potentially be tempted to draw unhealthy attention to ourselves. Everything we do is to be to His glory, not to our own. And so we need to watch out for the God of self-promotion. There is a God, but it's not me. And I need to remember that. Now here's the second thing that I want us to see. And that is that sometimes I need help in life. Sometimes I need help in life. You know, we all have needs. Some needs are physical. We have physical needs at every stage of life. I think, though, we may perhaps think more about when we get into our golden years and our health is declining and we're not as mobile as we used to be and we have other issues that have come with our age. And so we have physical needs that come into our lives. We have spiritual needs. We have emotional needs. And we need to ask for help when we are overtaken by these things. But sometimes we're, we don't do that. We're averse to asking for help. We, we don't want to reach out to other people. Maybe we don't ask for help because we know that there are other people in the congregation, in our family, in the community. There are other people who have greater needs than I do. 
And so if anybody is going to be helped, it needs to be them, not me. I get that. Sometimes we don't ask for help because we don't want to burden other people. Well, you know, they've got so much going on in their life. They're busy at work. They've got the kids and there's just so many things that they're dealing with. I don't want to add to their burden. I understand that. But sometimes we don't ask for help because of pride. And I think this is especially true when it comes to our spiritual needs. Now, if you were here last Sunday night... And you remember the sermon that I preached about the church being a hospital and not a hotel. You may be thinking, you said some of this stuff last week. Well, I wasn't planning to preach tonight. And this is the sermon that I had with me. But I think sometimes we think to ourselves, you know, if, if I reach out to the elders and I tell them about this spiritual need that I have, that... That's going to, by default, just admit some deficiency in my spiritual life. Or, you know, if I ask for, for help with the spiritual things in my life, then that means that people are going to find out about my struggles and my trials and my temptations. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. So what? So what? We are told... To lean on our brethren for, hello, that was fast. We are told to lean on our brethren for help and assistance. Go with me to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Look at verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Now, in the previous verse, in verse 1, he presented a situation. He said, Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass or any sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. So here we have a man who is overtaken in a trespass. Now, this is not a person who was deliberately seeking to go out and sin, to deliberately disobey the Lord. This is a person who was just overcome in a moment of weakness. And he says, if someone is overcome, those of you who are spiritually strong, you go to his aid and you help him. And then in verse 2, he says, bear one another's burdens. In other words, you go help the man who's overtaken in sin because, verse 2, that's our job. We bear the burdens of each other. And so we need to reach out and we need to help them. And so there are spiritual burdens that we bear that we need to help one another bear those things. We need to help each other under that weight. But go to James chapter 5. Sometimes, as I said, we have physical problems too. We have physical problems too. And James, in this context, he, he brings together the physical issues, the, the physical illnesses that we deal with, and he, he then mentions the spiritual too. Look at James 5 and, and verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Now, I know there's a lot of debate and discussion about, you know, what is the significance of the, the anointing oil and, and all of that. I, I don't know. I don't want to get into that. But what does James say? He says, if you're sick, I think physically, if you're sick, call upon the elders of the church. Let them come and pray for you. And in that way, they are sharing in a burden that you have. Call upon anybody in the congregation. And we can all share in that physical burden that you have. There have been times when um, Stacy and I were sick. And sick at the same time. In fact, just a couple of years ago, it was a Sunday afternoon, Stacy had a stomach virus. And I took the girls to worship and uh, that Sunday evening. And I stood up to preach, and there were some brethren there who were tending to our children while I was preaching. 
And I started to not feel real good. And that bug had hit me too. And I remember I was preaching on Philemon. So it's going to be a short sermon anyway. I mean, it's just, you know, one chapter. But it became a really short sermon. I was sweating profusely. My stomach was just turning in knots. And I said, I got to get out of here. And so I just stopped in the middle of the sermon and I said, if you need to come, come. We're singing. And I walked out. And I went home and Stacy and I sat on the bed and we commiserated. But you know who wasn't sick was our children. And we really needed some help. And so one of the elders and his wife, they came and they got our children and they took care of them for a few hours until my parents could drive down from Middle Tennessee and get the girls. You know, we were sick and we needed help. And it took both of us throwing up for hours to admit it. But we needed help. And good brethren came to our aid. But look at verse 16. Now he says, therefore... Now, don't miss that. If you're sick, verse 14... Call upon the elders, let them pray. And their prayer will restore, and God will raise him up. And if he's committed any sins, so now he starts to shift to the spiritual at the end of verse 15. If he's committed any sins, now they'll be forgiven. And then verse 16, therefore, confess your sins to one another. And pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So I want to ask you. What areas in your life do you need help in? Do you need help in your marriage? Are, are you going to ask for help at the first signs of trouble? Or are you going to wait until that ink pen is half an inch away from the divorce papers? You know, when I do premarital counseling for young couples... Which, by the way, if you ever ask me to perform your ceremony, that is a requirement. But when I do premarital counseling with young couples, I tell them, if the two of you start fighting and throwing things at each other, you ask for help right then. Don't come to me when you're 10 minutes away from a divorce and say, oh, by the way, we need some help. Because when we get to that point, there's nothing that I can do for you. Practically speaking. But if you come and ask for help in those early stages of difficulty, the chances of you overcoming those things are so much greater. So if you need help in your marriage, are you going to ask for help? What about with your children? Do you have trouble with your children? Do you have trouble with your young children and getting them to, to listen and obey? Do you have trouble with your teenagers getting, you to open, getting them to open up and talk to you? Listen, I remember how that was. Son, how was your day? Yeah. It was fine. I'm going to my friend's house. If you have those kinds of troubles, what are you going to do about it? Are you just going to let it continue and just, well, you know, maybe we'll hope it'll get better? Or are you going to find a good, strong brother and sister in Christ who have raised some strong, godly children and go to them and say, hey, I need some advice. Can you help me? Are you going to ask for help with your developing bad habits? Are you going to seek help in the early stages of that bad habit? Or are you going to wait until it turns into a full-blown addiction before you reach out for help? What about your major life decisions? Should we take this job? Should we not? Should we buy that house? Should we not? Should we move to this new state? Should we not? Those are major decisions that should not be taken lightly. Are you going to seek advice? Or are you just going to go for it and hope everything works out? I need help at times. And I think if we're all honest with ourselves, we would say we do too. Don't be afraid to ask for it. Now here's the third thing. I need to remember to keep my priorities rightly placed. I think the greatest problem for us is keeping our focus on spiritual things. I know that we worry about false doctrines that are out there and we need to know what they are and we need to know the truths of Scripture that will defeat them. I believe that. 
But I think the greatest problem for my spiritual life is not false doctrine, but it's me not focusing on spiritual things. It's me not keeping my priorities in the right place. And I think that's probably the case for most of us Western American Christians. Because of the lives that we live and the abundance that we share in that is a gift from God, we lose focus on spiritual things. Or maybe it's because of the busyness of life. We have so many things that are pulling for our time and our resources and our attention. And so we have our baseball teams and our soccer teams and we have the clubs and the organizations that we belong to and all of these things and these distractions. They're hurting us in so many ways. We're pouring so much of our money into these things that we have too much month at the end of the money. They're pulling our, our time away from things that are truly important that by the time we pillow our heads at night it takes us 26 seconds to fall asleep because we're so exhausted. It's damaging our relationships with other people because we can't put the kinds of time investment into those relationships with them as we'd like to because we are running ourselves ragged trying to get to all of the different activities we have going on. But most importantly of all, these kinds of things, again, not bad things. I got no problem with baseball and soccer and theater and piano lessons. I have no problem with any of those things at all. But those things, they can suck the lives out of Christians and suck the life out of churches. So we have our responsibilities to deal with. We talked about 1 Timothy 5 and verse 8 this morning. That, that if any man does not provide for his own, and especially those of his own household, he is denied the faith, and he is worse than an unbeliever. We have what Jesus called in Luke chapter 8 and verse 14, in the parable of the sower, he, he talked about the worries, the riches, and the pleasures of this world. And those were the things that Jesus called the thorns that choke out the Word. They choke out the spiritual fruit that is produced or that could be produced. But I think Jesus gives us an answer for each one of these things. Worries, riches, and pleasures. And He says, here's how you can prevent these things from becoming distractions. So here's what He says about worries. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6 verse 31. Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, when Jesus was preaching this Sermon on the Mount, He was talking to people who did not know where their meal tomorrow was coming from. Truly. And that's why He taught them to pray, give us today our daily bread, and we're going to pray the same thing tomorrow. These were people who truly did not know where their next meal was coming from. But Jesus says to them, don't worry about those things. If God feeds the birds and if God makes the grass green, He's going to feed your stomach. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about the clothes you're going to put on. God's going to provide for your basic needs. Our problem is not so much that we don't know where our next meal is coming from. The problem for us is we know where the next 372,000 meals are coming from. We have stocked refrigerators at home. We have stocked pantries. If we didn't, we would go to the store and we would buy the things that we need in order to stock our refrigerators and our pantries. And we don't ever worry about the grocery store not having any food, but you know what? They didn't have a Publix. They didn't have a Kroger back then. But we know where our meals are coming from. We just go to the store and we buy them. We know where our clothes are going to come from because we just go down to the Gap and we buy us a pair of jeans. We know where all of, or wherever you shop, but we know where all of our stuff is coming from. We don't have to worry about it. But here's what that does for us. 
it puts us in a position where we say, I'm rich. I have need of nothing. And we forget who it is who blesses us with the means that we have to get all the things that we want. To get all the things that we need. And we, we leave the Lord out. And that's when we need to remember, there is a God and it's not me. Jesus says about our worries, don't worry about these basic necessities. Don't worry about the things that you need. I'll provide for those things. God knows what your needs are. He will take care of you. Here's what he says about riches. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. You know, we're, we're looking at the words of Paul here. But Jesus had a lot to say about money. Jesus had a lot to say about riches and wealth and how we should treat that. And Paul, I think, teaching some of the same principles that Jesus would teach us. He says in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited. That's what we were just talking about. I know where my food's coming from. I know where my clothes are coming from. I know where the gas in my car is going to come from. And I don't have any problem paying for those things. And Paul says, now don't you get conceited about it. Don't you get haughty because you have riches. Don't be conceited. And he says also not to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. But on God who richly supplies us with all things. And don't leave off those last two words. To enjoy. Have you got a big house? Good for you. God gave you that house. You enjoy that house. As long as you're being a good financial steward of the money that God has given you and you can afford that house, then good for you. Use it for Him and His glory. What about that nice car that you drive? Can you afford that nice car that you drive? Good for you. God gave that to you. You enjoy that. And don't you ever let anybody shame you for having it. Or what about those nice clothes that you wear? God gave you those things. God gives us our gifts to enjoy Let's not forget that. Don't let somebody shame you because you have nice things. But to give balance to that, Paul says, now, don't you go around shaming everybody else if they don't have what you have. You don't become conceited. You don't become haughty. You see those things as a gift from God. And this is how you use these riches. Look at verse 18. Instruct them to do good. To be rich in good works. To be generous and ready to share. If you've got that great big house, don't be conceited, but share it with other people. If you've got that nice car that you can drive, don't be conceited about that, but just give somebody a ride. If you've got a, a, a big a, a balance in your checking account, don't become conceited about that, but, but be generous. Help somebody who may not have those things. And when you do that, verse 19 says, you will be storing up for yourselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. I love that expression. That which is life indeed. Money is not life indeed. The riches and the wealth that we can pile up in this life, that's not life indeed. Eternity. Heavenly treasure. That's the true life. That's the life indeed. And that's what we want. But Paul says, your money, your wealth in this life has something to do with the treasure that you build up in the next life. And so the, the stewardship of the things that God gives us in this life is connected to our heavenly treasure. What about our pleasures? Well, the Bible has answers for this too. James chapter 4. James 4. Beginning at verse 1, he says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is, it not the, is not the source the pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. When you do ask, you do not receive. Because you ask with the wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. What kinds of pleasures? Well, verse 4 helps us. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself 
an enemy of God. The pleasures he's talking about are those worldly pleasures that we seek after. And those things that really they get into our way. And I think these are, are, are sinful worldly pleasures. I mean, there are some things in life that are pleasures to us that are not sinful. For instance, I think one of the greatest pleasures that God gave to this world is a hot cup of coffee. And in fact, it's such a pleasure, I usually have about four every single day. And I don't think there's anything sinful in a cup of coffee. I don't think there's anything sinful about the, the pleasantness of sitting along the riverbank and listening to the, the stream as it goes by. That's a pleasure of this world. This is talking about sinful pleasures. This is talking about things that, that are wrong, things that we don't need to engage in. And James says that these things, they distract us. These things make us friends of this world rather than being friends of God. If we will keep our priorities where they need to be, as one man said, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And it's a little repetitive, but it's true. We know what the main thing is. You know what the main thing is. That's why you're here tonight. But we got to keep the main thing the main thing. And I need to remember that. And so these are some things that I need to remember. And they may be things that you need to remember as well. So I hope the lesson's been helpful. If there's someone here tonight who's not a Christian, or if there's someone who needs to come back to the Lord, if we can help you tonight in some spiritual way, we want to do that. If you'd please come as we sing this song.